Welcome, everybody, to Connecting the Universe. I'm author and researcher Mike Ricksecker back at you with another interactive class out of the secret library of the Connected Universe. Got another great one for you this evening. We're going to be diving into the Mandela effect and paradoxes in relation to time travel. I've covered each of these at various times in the past, uh, but we're going to put a little bit of a new spin on it for you this evening as we get into a number of these different topics. So I do want to let those that are listening to the podcast version of this later, please join us live every Wednesday night, connecteduniverseportal.com. Those that are members get access to the after show that we do uh, that's not on the public side. <laughs> there is a public uh, YouTube version of this that you can watch at my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash at M Ricksecker. But if you want the after show, uh, the members get that. Be a member out there, the connecteduniverseportal.com, and you get all the other amazing stuff that's there in the background. Of course, all the Connecting the Universe uh, classes that we do every single week. You get the uh, Mike's Morning Mug videos. You get the uh, the Q&A, the monthly Q&A. You've got the, the Egypt, the Ireland, the America Southwest, all of those. I mean, some of these are actual courses that I've uploaded uh, to, uh, you know, as a separate whole paid thing. Uh, the time travel course is up there for you. So a lot of, lot of information that the uh, the members of the Connected Universe Portal actually get out of that. So again, uh, ConnectedUniversePortal.com for those that are listening to us on the uh, audio version later. All right. So. Like I said, this is going to kind of piggyback on a lot of the uh, time travel information that I have in my book, Travels Through Time. So uh, Paradoxes has its own full chapter in there. We're not going to do the entire chapter, of course, this evening. Uh, Mandela Effect is in there as well. And I guess last call for the Stargates of Ancient Egypt tour, April 16th to the 28th. This would be like you know, dire last call for that. Uh, but you can find the links to that, MikeRicksecker.com, my events and tours section. We'll still take you, but um, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's kind of dive into this here. I see some people are already starting to filter in. There is Jen, great to see you, my love. Tom McNicholas is in the house and uh, others that are starting to filter in. What is, I mean, first and foremost, what is the Mandela effect? Uh, when we start talking about this type of phenomenon, people have heard of it, but they're not really exactly sure what it is. And they're Scarlet as well. Great to see you, Scarlet. So, well, there's Nelson Mandela. He passed away back in 2013. Well, that's kind of the crux of the matter here when we start talking about the Mandela effect. Uh, yes. He, he passed away in 2013. Um, there's all kinds of documentation, news coverage, et cetera, uh, that, that covered all of that. If you were to Google that, you would, you would find all of that information. It's right there. However, the problem is a lot of people remember him passing away during the 1980s when he was incarcerated. And just it vividly sticks out in their mind. And I remember when he passed away, um, a little over 10 years ago now, that I kind of scratched my head. I was like, well, I, I thought he had already, but he hadn't. And so um, I keep saying 2013. I guess it was 2000. I don't know. I was saying 2013. But in any case, um, or he died in 2013. I'm sorry. Um, but it was in 2009 where there's, there's news coming out about uh, Nelson Mandela and uh, paranormal researcher Fiona Bune, Broom, I'm sorry, uh, started calling this the Mandela effect because people thought that he had already died and he was actually still alive at the time. And then when he passed away, a lot more people came forward and said, wait a minute, I thought he was gone. So that's where this term comes from. But it's applicable, not just to that. It's applicable to a lot of different it has a lot of it's with branding where we seemingly are misremembering things from the past that were a different way or to us may have been a different way. 
And I uh, see others have filtered in here. Haley Stack is in the house. Great to see you, Haley. Crow Emil S. Great to see you, Emil. And so a couple of examples here, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, here we go. Spelling the Fruit Loops. Well, some people remember it as F-R-U-I-T, Loops as L-O-O-P-S. But the actual box has it as Fruit, F-R-O-O-T, Loops, L-O-O-P-S. But people remember it as the other spelling. It's Again, it's, it's kind of trivial. Uh, let's throw this one up there. This is from Snow White, the magic mirror, right? So when the evil stepmother is talking to the mirror, um, she says, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all, right? No. Actually, she says, magic mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all. But a lot of people remember mirror, mirror. And that was one that threw me off too. I always remember it as mirror, mirror. But it's actually magic mirror. So what's the deal with with this change? We're just going through a, a few here. I'm not going to go through because again, a lot of it is branding or misremembered pop culture. Oscar Meyer. Is it M E Y E R or M A Y E R? A lot of people think it's. <laughs> Spelled with an A, M A Y E R. But you know what? It's it's funny because we even had a jingle for this. My baloney has a second name. It's M E Y E R. That's one that I actually remember because of the jingle. <laughs> but a lot of people think it's A rather than E, and there's you know, millions of people that remember it a different way. So is it just mass misremembering, or is there something else going on here? Got one more. For you here as far as these go beautiful day in the neighborhood well, that's the way that many people remember that line so much so that the movie about mr rogers was named a beautiful day in the neighborhood it's not, it's not the line from the song it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood yeah so that that's one that even made it to a movie title kind of crazy but these are the sorts of things that have been cropping up over the years and it's not just a handful of people it's a lot of people from all over the world and i've had my own bit of interaction with this and not just from those uh, again it the branding is very very trivial and we're going to get into the aspects of time travel and how things have been changed throughout the timeline that causes this to happen. But nobody is purposefully going back in time to change branding or to change a song lyric or, or these sorts of things. Um, we'll get into that here in uh, in just a moment. But um, I have a clip here. It's from a video that I created almost four years ago now where I get, where I dive into the Mandela effect. And I talk about my own personal experience with this, my mother's personal experience uh, as well. And again, other people across the world. Now, if you look up top 10, top 20, top 50 uh, Mandela effects, you're not going to find this on there. You're going to find all kinds of stuff like we were just covering. Fruit Loops, Oscar Mayer, uh, lyrics to We Are the Champion, you know, uh, Mr. Monopoly, does he have a monocle or not? A lot of those sorts of things. This one is not on those lists, although you never know. Somebody may have added it to a list now that um, that I've been talking about this for some years now and have it in a book. Somebody may have added it on there at this point. But I'm going to go ahead and play this clip. It's from, uh, again, a video that I put together uh, about four years ago. I'll go ahead and link it here later. I don't think I have it linked in the description now, but I'll go ahead back in um, and add that uh, description to it. In fact, I think I forgot to do a few little things on the YouTube side for you guys that I usually do. But uh, here, let me go ahead and play this for you. 
My introduction to the Mandela Effect wasn't through Ms. Broom's website, or an article, or a YouTube video. I was introduced to the Mandela Effect when it happened to my mother and I. A few years ago, I was visiting my parents, and a World War II film was on the television. My mother and I both remarked that a favorite film of ours of the genre was an old black and white World War II film featuring ghosts playing baseball. They were a flight crew who had crashed in Africa and not knowing they were dead, played baseball near their crashed aircraft until they were rescued. Neither of us could remember the name of the film, so I told her I would look it up. Oddly, when I tried to look up this movie, I couldn't find it. Now, I'm a writer, and back in the day, I was a certified Maryland Library Associate, which means I know how to enter in better search terms to get a more accurate result. I was having an impossible time trying to find this movie. Finally, I found a reference to it on a forum about military aviation films, and others had the same question as I. What was this old black and white film with ghosts playing baseball? According to these film buffs, we were misremembering a movie called Soul Survivor, a color movie from the 1970s starring William Shatner. I was in disbelief, as were others in this forum. There was no way this was a color movie. It was definitely in black and white, and it absolutely did not have William Shatner in it. Yet, these experts in aviation films insisted it was the only movie of its kind, and it wasn't a remake of an earlier film. One of the contributors did mention the Mandela Effect. I asked my mother if she remembered at all that this was actually a color movie from the 1970s starring William Shatner. She insisted that no, this was long before Shatner was definitely black and white, and the ghost didn't know that they were dead at the beginning of the film. So I hunted down the Shatner film and decided to watch it. As I watched it, I really wasn't sure at first that this was the right movie. Yes, there were the ghosts playing baseball, but they already knew that they were dead. There was no question about that. The fact that it was in color was disconcerting, and the fact that William Shatner was in it seemed really off. Yet, the banter between the ghosts and the investigation into the crash seemed familiar. And then it happened, that one line from the movie. One of the ghosts wasn't the brightest guy in the world, and he was lingering over by the tents of the living, listening to a baseball game on the radio. When he returned to the other ghosts, they asked him how the game was. He said, it was good, but I don't understand how they moved Brooklyn to Los Angeles, a reference to the Dodgers move during the 1950s. It was that line, a line that had stuck with me ever since I was a kid because I thought it was funny that he thought that they had moved the entire city of Brooklyn to Los Angeles and not just the team, the Dodgers itself. That was it. This was absolutely the movie. Another scene toward the end of the movie, when the ghosts disappeared as the bodies were found, helped to seal the deal, as was the closing moments when the one ghost was left alone, his body trapped under the tail section of the airplane which is ultimately why they call the movie Soul Survivor. I couldn't believe it. How could I, my mother, and all of these other people remember this movie being one particular way? And yet, it wasn't. We're talking about people from all over the world who have never met each other from all different points in time, remembering it the same exact way. How is that possible? How is that possible? I don't know why that always cuts off there a little bit at the end. A little bit annoying. But um, yeah, Tom says he sees uh, Ichabod Cranium. Yeah, Ichabod is still around. I, I put him up around Halloween these days, but uh, the background's kind of changed over the years. Uh, Haley says, Fruit of the Loom is the one I lose sleep over. You know, that is one that uh, I do remember it with the cornucopia in the background. But apparently there was never a cornucopia. It was just the fruit. But yeah, I remember it like that. So we have this tendency to remember things a little bit differently than, than we are seeing today. So when we look up, okay, you know, what was the branding of such a thing back in the day? Or, or even, you know, now maybe it's lasted all these years and we see that it's a little bit different. And we're scratching our heads. Wait a minute. I remember it this way. Again, some of the things are... Yeah, we, we are mis mishmashing some things like Mr. Monopoly. Does he have a monocle? Well, that's kind of getting mashed up with Mr. Peanut, you know, the planters, Mr. Peanut. I get that. Uh, but some of these others 
like that one with Shatner is is a real head scratcher. And and I have to give it to Bill. Um, he's kind of inspired this whole discussion this evening following the uh, the photo that we had together there the other day. So when I uh, put that blog post together, for those that haven't checked out the blog yet, it's uh, connecteduniverse.substack.com. Um, when I was writing about that, I said, yeah, let, let's go ahead and it's been a little while. Let's go ahead and cover the Mandela effect again. Let's cover some paradoxes uh, because really what we're seeing here is, again, it's very, very trivial for somebody to go back in time and change branding. Nobody's nobody's going back to yeah, 1900 or when, I don't know when Fruit of the Loom was established as a company, but they're not going back 100 years to erase out the cornucopia from the artwork of the brand. They're just not doing that. Um, it, it's just too trivial. But something could have happened preceding that. If you had a time traveler, go back. And it could be just a small thing. You know, Maybe they bump into somebody while they're watching and observing whatever the heck is going on. I think most time, time travelers are just observers watching and observing what's going on learning things about the past but sometimes they do interact with things within the environment that can create small alterations they might even not even think that it's a big deal but as those ripples extend out you know like a a ripple effect or a butter the butterfly effect as that extends out it can cause other changes to happen so I can't exactly say what that change would have been to make to make that happen, but it could be as little as um, you know they locked a door behind them, but the door wasn't supposed to be locked. It could be they were walking across the street to go watch and observe something else, and the car rounding the corner had to stop and break for them which would have altered their path further on down the street. Maybe they missed a red light, you know, that sort of thing because of that incident, which would have created a whole new chain of events. Now, how that would have changed the branding of, you know, cornucopia to not cornucopia, we don't know. Maybe it's one of those things that, you know, they happened to be, you know, at the market and they saw that setup and they liked it. And because of some little alteration in the timeline, they ended up not being at the market that day to see that and get inspired to include that uh, as the as the artwork, as the branding. And so they just threw the fruit in uh, without it. That's totally speculative of me. I'm just offering ideas and suggestions as to how those things may have changed over time. So this again is, is all going down the uh, you know, the idea of of time travel and how yes things from well right now we're talking about people from the future influencing things in the past that creates a new timeline for us. So when we talk about multiverse, you know these changes I don't believe creates a whole new universe. I do believe that there is a, you know, our science is showing it now, there's a parallel universe running in reverse time, which speaks to, we see in our ancient symbolism, the idea of duality as above, so below, these sorts of things. And that symbolism with the Ouroboros, the constant recycle and renewal. I'm not going to dive into all of that this evening. That's when I start getting into like my stack time theory and all that. So I'll reference you back to that. But when a change is made, it does have ripple effects all up and down that stack of time. So, all right. So that's the bit on the Mandela effect. We have other things to get into. We get a bit into uh, paradoxes right now. It's not going to be the full paradox course because we've done that in the past. And I'm going to end up throwing some links in here to uh, some of these other some of these references that I'm making right now about this material. I'm going to throw some links in there. Should have done it earlier. I did have some time to add those in there. And I started working on other things that I'm preparing for tomorrow. 
Um, so I'll go back and do that though for you guys. Um, all right. So paradoxes. Paradoxes are another way that the uh, a change in time, a change in the timeline is resolving itself. That's all of what these things are. The Mandela effect, paradoxes, they're, a, they're the way that a change in the timeline is, is resolving itself so that things can continue to, to flow. So I'm going to throw this paradox at you. I, lo I love this one um, because here's the, here's the thing. Um, a lot of scientists get hung up on the idea of paradox. So actually, I'm going to read this uh, paragraph straight out of my book. Many theorists in the scientific field disregard time paradoxes, such as the Navokov self-consistency principle. In other words, the concept that if an event would cause a paradox or some alteration to the past, then the probability of that event occurring is zero. I'll cover that a little bit more here in just a bit. And they cling to the belief that if something creates one of these mind benders, then it can't truly exist outside of science fiction storylines. Some even suggest various paradoxes like the grandfather paradox, if one could truly ever exist, would actually break the universe. Typically, these theorists get hung up on the mathematical elements of a logic problem. And since it can't be resolved, in what might be considered a rationally, rationally acceptable solution, the whole thing must be thrown out. Consider this paradox. I love this one. <laughs> and I use this in Travels Through Time. Cheese has holes. Okay, that's the statement we're starting with. Cheese has holes. So, then more cheese equals more holes. Well but more holes equals less cheese. Therefore, more cheese equals less cheese. It's a logic problem that totally breaks. Sort of. It only breaks because of the fact of what, what we know about cheese, right? In, in the context of cheese, it, it doesn't work in our mind. Mathematically, it works. It's a, it's a transitive property of equality. The property that states that two quantities equal to a third quantity are equal to each other. So in this particular example here, so it's it's basically if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So an example, if one plus two equals three and three equals seven minus four, then naturally one plus two equals seven minus four, which is true. That basically equates out to three equals three. Well, the same thing is true with this cheese thing. And this is a meme. I, I absolutely had used it in my book as an as a example. Uh, and I totally ripped it off of a meme. But it's so true. It's it's one of those little twists to, uh, to, screw, to screw with mathematicians because they've got this transitive property, but it doesn't work in the logic word problem there. And they get hung up on that. They absolutely get hung up on that. They want the math to work right, but it needs to also work within the context of what we know in our everyday reality. Without thinking outside the box that our everyday reality is not all of reality. There's so much more going on in this universe that we can't see with our own eyes. Other dimensions that are around us all the time. The idea that all time is concurrent. Yeah, some theoretical physicists like Einstein and some others have postulated that, but a lot of these others just get so hung up on, I can't see it, so therefore it doesn't exist, which is bullshit. <laughs> Sorry, just had to go there. Just boom. Um, it, but it is. Um, there's so, so much more going on uh, around us that we can't see our eyes only see into a very narrow band of the spectrum so yeah we're not going to see all of these things we don't see radio waves and gamma rays and and all these other things that are around us that we know exist and so this for mathematicians just breaks down so we'll take uh the grandfather paradox we kind of mentioned that already here we go so Typical, 
uh, timeline. Grandfather uh, is alive. Father is born. You can say mother as well. Uh, person is born. The grandchild is born. The grandchild goes back in time, does something to screw up the, uh, the existence of their grandfather. So he cannot procreate, can't create the father or the mother, and therefore the grandchild is not born. And we use this as a grandfather paradox because of uh, science fiction short stories from 80 years ago. But um, you could go back and it could be a parent, which is what we see in Back to the Future. Marty McFly goes back. He screwed back in time. 1955 screws up the meeting of uh, his his father and his mother. They don't fall in love. <laughs> his mother starts falling in love with him, which is a little creepy. And um, so it starts erasing the existence of his brother or sister and uh, ultimately himself. And his whole goal is to try to get those two back together so they can fall in love and keep the timeline intact. Now, um, so it's it's you know science fiction type storyline um, utilizing the grandfather paradox. I believe that if he had gone back and screwed up, yes, that meeting of him in uh, of uh, I'm sorry of his father and his mother, that he would have still existed there in that time. Yes, it would have been a paradox, but he still would have been there. But yeah, in the future, he would therefore not have been born. So he would have been a man out of time, essentially, as he got older in 1956, seven, eight, nine, if he would have stayed there um, and not got his parents back together. Um, that's, um, that's my conjecture to it. That's the way that I believe all of this works. Um, I don't believe it would have created a new timeline. Um, and yeah, I don't believe that he would have disappeared, but that is essentially the, the grandfather paradox. Now, again, um, many scientists, uh, you know, scoff at, at the notion, in fact, in the 1980s, and I'm not sure if it was, um, inspired by back to the future, but, um, the Novikov consistency, self-consistency principle that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, I'll, I'll grab this out of the book. So it's developed in the mid 1980s by Russian physicist Igor Dmitriev, Dmitrievich Novikov. Uh, the Novikov self-consistency principle essentially states that while time travel is possible, time paradoxes are forbidden because mathematically, the probability of the event creating the paradox would be zero. This is also referred to as the time travel protection hypothesis or chronology protection con protection conjecture. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Pick a term. So, yeah, so you have a, um, a physicist here basically saying, sure, time travel could be pos possible, but you're not really going to be able to change anything and create a paradox because of the math. The math isn't going to work out correctly. So. You have two other physicists that are debating this, um, Kip Thorne and Joe Polchinski. And they're having some conversations back and forth about how it could actually work. You could actually have this paradox. Remember, they typically scoff at the whole notion of the grandfather paradox. So Polchinski comes up with this idea. He says, okay, take a billiard ball and shoot it through a wormhole or an Einstein-Rosen bridge. Now, this is, of course, acceptable to them because Einstein's gen, uh, theory of general relativity, we do accept that the possibility of wormholes, they call it the Einstein-Rosen bridge because uh, Albert Einstein, Nathan Rosen, that came up with this idea using um, general relativity, and so science accepts us that this is completely possible. We're trying to create the thing in the lab. So shoot the billiard ball into the Einstein-Rosen bridge, but set the end of it, the other side of it, basically loop it back around to a moment just before the billiard ball 
passes into the wormhole at such an angle that it knocks the billiard ball off course. So then the question becomes, how would the billiard ball be able to come around and pass through and hit itself if it never entered in there to begin with? It's a paradox. But this here with the billiard ball is pretty much exactly the same thing as the grandfather paradox. We're just talking billiard balls and wormholes rather than a time machine and killing a grandparent. It's the only difference. But they accept this one. This one's okay to talk about because it's using science rather than science fiction. But it's the same dang thing. <laughs> Um, and Tom down there, I think William Shatner is a paradox himself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, he's 93 years old and he's still going out and doing those events. Um, he's very alert. He's very spry. He's still, he's still doing the unexplained. Uh, so he's still doing television and everything. And yeah, just the fact that he's going out to events for the fans when he doesn't need to. It's not like he needs the money. And, you know, they were telling us as we were going in there, um, you know, don't really try to touch him or anything like that because, you know, health concerns and all that sort of stuff. But he's right there. Um, you know, you're, you're right next to him. You're breathing on him. Um, so he, he doesn't have to do all that, but still does. Um, so and, and that's and that's a great thing that he does that for the fans. So, um, yeah, Scarlet. So these sorts of paradoxes, when you go back and make that change, uh, can create what we're calling the Mandela effect because um, as those changes permeate over the stack of time, um, it's going to... So people that are there in the future, if you change one of those things from the past, people, therefore, as that change affects the everything on the timeline, people in the future should have that memory of whatever that thing is altered because they would never then have experienced it. So it's almost like a erasure like take a document on your computer a, a, just say like a word document or whatever and you've read the thing and um your i don't know your co-worker has read it as well but then you go and change a few things in the document and your co-worker comes back to it and says is reading through it again like wait a minute i thought this read a little bit different and i remember you know, this being worded a different way. So part of them, they might not remember every single little thing, but part of them remembers it being a bit different, even though you went ahead and changed it. So typically, though, they wouldn't have that many, but sometimes a little bit stays in there where they do recall what that was prior to the change. So, um, why some people remember it and why some people don't, I can't tell you that. That's one of the one of the great mysteries of the universe. We're trying to figure these things out. And you know, having these discussions like this helps to get us to try to talk about it and, and try to figure it out. Maybe somebody will make that connection here. If if we are in a simulated universe, which I do believe that we are, then um then the data within that universe can be altered and changed and um and what have you to, you know, and it's going to affect the whole, the whole thing will be affected because it's all right here, right now. All right. So that's the grandfather paradox, um, the Polchinski paradox. So I'm going to talk a little bit here about the, the bootstrap paradox, because this is the one that 
th this has some of the really, really more interesting things. And I have um, some personal stories with this one as well. So basically the bootstrap paradoxes, we see this used a lot in science fiction, film, stories, these, these sorts of things. So uh, again, I'll, I'll read here from um, Travels Through Time. In a bootstrap paradox, self-existing objects or pieces of information in a causal loop have no point of origin. For example, a person travels back in time to give him or herself an object to perform some act which he or she retains until that moment in the future when a journey through time is made to give it to him or herself again. The object is never introduced from an outside party of this loop and thus has no actual origin. So, a bit of a mouthful. Um, boom, it's a definition. So I actually give some examples here. So I'm going to start with Somewhere in Time, so one of my all-time favorite movies. And so we start with at the very beginning of the film where this elderly woman walks up to Christopher Reeve's character, Richard Collier, and hands him this pocket watch. He has no idea who she is and no idea why she is giving it to him. Well, over the course of the movie he discovers who she is but discovers that back in 1912 she was a you know, young beautiful woman he's at the grand hotel falls in love with her photo he wants to go back in time and meet her and sorry if i'm spoiling it here but the movie's over 40 years old so <laughs> go watch it um so he goes back he achieves it goes back in time meets her they do fall in love it's it's a at its heart it's a love story but it's got the time travel that's involved with it he gives her the watch so he's had it all of this time all of these years he gives it to her just think he's just showing it to her you know it's it's you know um you know she wants to take a look at it it's one of the things that he has kept all of these years that actually fits his um his costume that he's uh, wearing you know he's from 1980 he's going back to 1912 but moments after she has it in hand he basically breaks his time travel um he he sees a modern penny that's that he had had in his pocket and it reminds him that he's from 1980. Boom. It breaks his, I would say, meditative state. Breaks that. He ends up back in 1980. She still has the pocket watch. And she holds on to that from 1912 all the way to 1980 until she's an elderly woman and hands it back to him. So this is all a loop with the pocket watch it never leaves either one of their possessions either richard has it or elise has it it goes back and forth between the two from 1912 to 1980 1912 to 1980 that's a bootstrap paradox the watch is never bought it's never found on a dresser um it's never given as a gift from an outside party like somebody else. Um, it only goes between Richard and Elise in a loop. It's a bootstrap paradox, no origin. Um, another more modern example of this in a story, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. So uh, in this particular scene, this is where... Um, Harry's at the the side of the pond and Sirius is on the ground. The Dementors are attacking and um, you know, they're basically they're getting killed by these things. And then um, all of a sudden the, the white Patronus of the Stag comes across and saves them all. At this point in time, he has no idea where it came from. He... He believes it's his dad. Well, a little while later, in order to kind of fix things that have happened, um, 
Hermione has the time turner. Harry and Hermione go back in time. Um, there are a number of things that they're trying to fix. And so they get to this point where they're seeing, they're not supposed to interact with each other. You're not supposed to see yourself, um, which is one of the rules here in this story. But they get to that point where they're seeing the Dementors attacking Harry and Sirius at the side of the pond. And Harry, again, believes it's his dad. And he's waiting for him to show up. He's waiting for him to show up. He's like, my dad should be here any moment to you know, do this. And his dad's dead. But somehow he thinks. And then all of a sudden he realizes that, no, it was himself all along. And he steps up and boom, you know, casts the spell. And you know, all the Dementors flee. And then he ends up telling Hermione afterwards, they're flying away. He's like, um, yeah, I ended up realizing that it was myself all along. He had had problems trying to cast this spell like throughout the whole movie. And he finally ends up saying, yeah, I finally realized that I could do it because I did it. I saw myself do it. So I knew I could do it. So again, you have this causal loop with no origin to it, which you know what happened first harry uh you know casting the patronus or harry you know dying you know one can't happen without the other there's no origin to that loop when was the first time when was the first time it happened to start the loop because if he hadn't been if he hadn't gone back in time to be across the water he would have he would have died. So he had to somehow go back in time at some point to get back there to save himself. This is ongoing loop over and over again. So this takes us into, um, and yes, uh, Scarlet, uh, they're definitely, these are definitely classics. So this brings us to the concept of the future influencing the present or future influencing the past. So um, the book Man in Time, J.B. Priestley uh, goes into this the book from the uh, 1960s. I've, uh, I've talked about it here many times before on Connecting the Universe. I did, of course, reference it uh, for my book, Travels Through Time. Uh, Richard Madison referenced it and actually includes like a whole, you know, uh, almost like a book review in uh in his book somewhere in time well it was originally called bedtime return but he ended up um it, they ended up renaming it somewhere in time because people are so familiar with the movie uh we went over that actually um some weeks back maybe a month or two ago so i'm not going to get into all of that well let's get into um you know some different examples here um so one of my favorites here i'm going to talk my my story with uh with jennifer where um you know we've known each other my fiance jennifer we've known each other since first grade uh you know it's been a long long time and there was this incident where you know we hadn't really had much interaction you know the beginning of that school year but all of a sudden one day we're in the library and over there at a stack of books and i'm looking through the books to try and find something to read. And again, this is in first grade. And then all of a sudden she comes up right next to me, kisses me on the cheek. And I'm like, oh, what was that? You know, I'm blushing and I'm all shy. Oh, <laughs> what in the world happened there? Um, but it's, it's not like we developed a little boyfriend, girlfriend relationship or anything like that uh, at that point in time. We were fourth grade together. In seventh grade, we kind of, quote unquote, went out for about a month. I was too timid and scared to hold, to even hold her hand. Even though the, the girl had already kissed me back in first grade. Now it's like, uh, I don't know. Just, you know, 12 year olds. Yeah, we're kind of weird at that age. Well, eighth grade, um, I ended up moving away. And then we were out of touch for like 21 years. Well, you know, social media comes along and uh, we reconnect. You know, we catch up with each other and all that stuff. She was with somebody. I was married, all that. So we're just, you know, hey, how you doing? Um, and it's like that for for many years. Um, you know, every once in a while, our paths would cross. We'd get together for dinner, just catch up, that sort of thing. Well, um, almost two years ago now, we had the Ireland trip. And on that trip, we were both single at the time, and we 
we hit it off and you know, now we're together. So we, we kind of joke around. That was the longest first date ever. Neither of us went into that tour with those intentions, but we came out together. So now we were together. We went back to our old hometown. We're checking out our old haunts. And of course we went back to our elementary school, which is now part of the, uh, the college that's there. The college was always right next to it. And they just ended up taking over the school, turning into a performing arts center. So we're walking the grounds, looking through the windows, you know, pointing out, Hey, you know, here's kindergarten and you know, there's the first grade classroom, all that stuff. So we walk around the building. We uh, last place that we hit was the library where that first kiss happened. And so you can see there, the door is, you know, uh, the whole door is a window. And so um, where the kiss happened was at a stack of books, right? You see those little windows there on the side, basically it was on the other side of those. And you know, we're pointing in there. Hey, that's where it happened. That's where it happened. And let's keep this in mind. But during one of the times that Jennifer and I had, whether it was over a dinner or whether it was one of the conversations that we had had, I had asked her, hey, what, what was the deal with the kiss on the cheek? And she said, I don't know. Yeah, you had a you had a chubby cheek sitting there and something told me to kiss your cheek. OK, so we're right there at the window and Jen is playfully calling through the window. Kiss him, kiss him. And, you know, we're kind of laughing. Yeah, OK, that's fun. But then it dawned on us a little bit later. Wait a minute. She said that. Something had told her to kiss my cheek. So was it her, you know, as a six-year-old, was she hearing her 40-something-year-old self telling her to kiss my cheek? And if that's the case, right here, we have a bootstrap paradox. Because her six-year-old self then would not have just suddenly kissed my cheek if her 40-year-old self wasn't there by the window telling her to do so. Now, when we talk stacked time theory, every single, every, everything's concurrent. It's all there. Every single moment, take where you're standing. And I talk about this all the time. Take where you're standing, where you're sitting right now. And every moment that has happened, is happening, and will happen are all there concurrently right now. And then I go on and talk about, you know, sometimes there are two, you know, Two moments that resonate at the same frequency, and you know we get what happens with you know a time slip. But time slips aside, if everything is right there right now, then as her six-year-old self is inside that room, which is just set up as a little mu music room now, but at six it was a library. At forty something, I won't say the exact number, um, standing right there by the door. Again, every moment that has happened is happening and will happen all there right now. So they are within eight, 10 feet of each other. And it's just a matter of that message getting sent across time. The location is right there. It's just a matter of sending that intention, that message, through time, which is a form of time travel. It's a frequency, it's a resonance, an energy, it's a vibration that is getting sent through entanglement, really. <laughs> There's Jen, you big, sappy, handsome man. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so. Uh, another one here that was, uh, really interesting that could, could be, don't know for certain, but could be a causal loop. And that's at a restaurant called Johnny V's in Muskogee, Oklahoma investigation. We did, geez, probably good 13 years now. It's been a long time. Um, it was paranormal investigation that we were running there. Um, they'd been experiencing hauntings there for, for many, many years. And um, 
we were just wrapping up this investigation. We'd, we'd already done everything. Uh, there are a couple guys up in the bar area, a couple of others that were in the front restaurant area. And I decided to do a last photo sweep of the restaurant. And as I'm walking through the main doors of the kitchen, all of a sudden there was this shadow that just darted across the room and then boom, smacked right into, you can see it here in this photo, uh, this flimsy little metal door that was on the side of the room. Now this is like one of those real thin metal doors and you, and you could tap it and the thing moves. You know, it's just so waiters and waitresses can carry large trays of food through the thing. The interesting thing about that is that even though you heard the boom, the slam of that door, the door itself didn't actually move. I have an audio clip of it. I wasn't running video at the time. I was taking photos, but I did still have my audio recorder on and, and recording everything. And so I call out to the others. Hey, did you guys hear that? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We heard that. So I started explaining what happened. And then it starts in my mind. Okay, these guys are messing with me because I was on my own. Um, the guys up in the, because the bar area was kind of like a loft area up there. Um, they throw something down. You know, the the people that are out in the front of the restaurant area, that'd be a long throw for them. And they'd have to be pretty accurate. And uh, Chris and Kathy, I, I would not say were um, baseball pitchers. <laughs> and then the guys, you know, even if they did throw something from down, they would have to make that arc and come back around to hit it the right way. It would be a really weird shot. But I still... Um, and I even asked, yes, there anything down here? No. <laughs> so I even opened up that door and I'm looking around on the ground just to see so nothing on the ground. Okay. They did not throw anything at the door. So then why didn't it move if something slammed into it? So I've been talking about this particular example for many years you know, even before I wrote A Walk in the Shadows, which is where I first featured this story. And I use this to talk about um, this being some sort of interdimensional being. And it's what's and it's still the case. Um, so take this shadow and you're talking about two different planes of existence on its plane of existence. I believe that it blew right through that door. You know, I scared it. It, it thought maybe... I don't know exactly how it saw me, but it's like maybe it saw me as a ghost. Maybe it saw me as a shadow. I scared that thing or person, and it blew right through that door. I believe on its plane of existence, that door blew wide open and off he or she ran. My plane of existence, though, you know, physicality, the physical door, on my plane of existence did not move because it didn't touch it on in this dimension or in this plane of existence or in this moment in time it did in the other but sound works on a bit of a different wavelength and so i was able to hear that permeate through the dimensional space or through space time and so that's what this illustration represents so this is where i've changed a little bit on this. And I include in the introductions to my books, I reserve the right to change my mind. It's not really fully changing my mind on this. It is I'm tweaking it a little bit because it's still, we're, we're talking um, different places in space time. We are talking something that would be considered interdimensional if we were talking about two different moments in time. And so, you know, I pretty much believe now that I was interacting with somebody that was there on another at another point in time, either in the past or even in the future. You know, we're not always just interacting with things from the past. Many times we're interacting with things from the future. And so, you know, I got a little bit of a glimpse of it. I was tuned into that frequency a little bit as, you know, as far as the visual aspect tune into the visual aspect of it a little bit the sound part of it you tuned right into that um so here's the thing though if this person was in the past 
And like I said, you know, probably saw me as a ghost or maybe you saw me as a shadow. If, if I'm seeing it as a shadow and that's the way that we're tuned into that moment, it probably saw me as a shadow too. So if this person was in the past, then this could very well have been one of the reported hauntings back in the day when people talked about this building being haunted and there's ghosts and there's spirits and all kinds of other stuff going on in there. I could have been one of those incidents. We, that day, could have been the reason that we were investigating that building to begin with. That's a paradox. That is absolutely a paradox. Us having to investigate in, was it 2011? So that somebody in, I will just say 1980, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what year that person would have been in. Was so that the person in 1980 could have reported about the haunting so that years later, we're coming back to investigate. And that's a loop. That's a bootstrap paradox. Which is fascinating to think about. All right. So, now, one other aspect to discuss here, when we get to the after show, those that are members of the Connected Universe portal, we're going to uh, hit on a couple of other things uh, here. One specifically, but, um, and it will be related to this. Um, but we're going to, we're going to start the conversation here and then we'll carry it over into the, into the after show on the Connected Universe portal. All right. Dreams and premonitions. Dreams and premonitions are also a way that the future can influence the present. How so? Well, for one, when it's not every dream, of course, but when you have a dream that does come true, that is an image of the future, your consciousness enters into different, well, your brain enters into different brainwave states as you dream, as you sleep. And there are times in which your consciousness can free float to other places. It can free float to other realms. It can free float to other points in time. Sometimes it connects to the collective unconscious and you get downloads of information. Other times it can, yes, you go and you watch and observe another moment in time play out. And you bring that back with you, and all of a sudden, it might be the next day, it might be a week, it might be a month later, whatever it is. All of a sudden, the whole scene plays out, and you're like, I just had a dream about this. What in the world? Or sometimes it might be like a little bit of a deja vu moment. You know, I know this happened. But and really, it was you know out of one of those visions that you had. Well, that, for one, is a, is a form of time travel. And some people are um, you know, very you know, cognizant of, <clears throat> of those things. And so um, they take that information with them. And then when that situation arises, like some of these, they almost take as like warnings. Um, and they change the outcome of whatever that event was about to be, be based on the information that they had in that vision. So that is the future influencing the present. That's something that you got a glimpse of from another point in time ahead of you, altered your decision-making so that you would change the actual outcome of that moment. So that's another way in which uh, through a time travel type mechanism that the future can influence the present. All right. Well, we are about at the end here. So I do want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Those that are part of the Connected Universe portal, please hang in there. We are going to kick over into the after show. We're going to get a little bit more specific on this particular point on dreams and, and premonitions. <clears throat> Um, I do encourage those that are 
Well, those that are watching right now, if you want to grab a subscription to the Connecting Universe portal and join us for the after show, definitely encourage that. Those that are listening to the uh, podcast version of this later is ConnectingUniversePortal.com. And I do encourage you to join us every Wednesday night, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time for the live version of this. The, the video that I played, the, all the photos that I've tossed up there, you get to see those rather than listening to them. Although I do realize that listening while you're you know driving to work or maybe you're doing a cross-country trek, I totally get it which is why I offer the audio version, uh, but would love to see all you guys out here uh, with us for the live show as well. So, um, so, and uh, thank you to, okay. And, and others that are uh, throwing down in here at the end here, Diana, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Scarlett, of course, Sage Sleuth, <laughs> dang it. You're always late. Eight o'clock PM Eastern <laughs> set an alarm. <laughs> you can join us uh sean Clotta, great to see you down in there been a little while been a little while buddy uh good to see you there as well uh mr cumin good to see you as well so um all right everybody uh we're gonna kick over into the after show till next time time really exists <laughs>